Uh, I am very blessed to be here today. I, uh, I would rather speak here than anywhere else. This is my home. This is my, my ohana. And uh, not only am I blessed today with, with my regular church members, I have friends that have, are visiting, friends that have been blessings, immense blessings in my life. And I want to thank you for coming today. You know, I'm going to give you a little secret about sermon preparation. Um, I'll have something in my head, something I know is a hit. I'm ready to go with it. And in my head, I'm thinking, okay, here's the points, here's the points. They're going to really like it. They're going to get it. And we're going to share God's word. It's going to be awesome. And about three days out, God says, I don't want you to speak on that. I got something else for you. And so in studying with our kids, we have worship, you know, every evening. It's funny how much we learn from our children. It's funny how children take God and his word so easily. And yet we who are older and more jaded look at God's word and we're kind of like, yeah, we don't get excited about it. But we were studying this story about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And my kids were so involved in it and so, so just really, really enjoying it and had so many questions for us. And those questions kind of, kind of you know, really pointed out some things that I never thought about. And so today I'm going to share the message with you. And it's entitled, The Image Part 2. The Image Part 2. Before we start, I'd like to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for your blessings. We want to thank you for your Sabbath, Father, that we can congregate together in fellowship and we can uh, talk about your word, Father. There's no greater calling that we can have or no greater privilege than to share with you, Father, on your day. And Father, we ask that you uh, guide us in your truth, not my truth, not our truth, but your truth, Father. In your name we pray, amen. So I'm going to be reading a lot from Daniel 3 today. So if you guys would turn there, please. There's Daniel chapter 3. You guys kind of know the story. I mean, everybody's heard. That's one of the fa you know, famous Bible stories. Everybody's heard the story of the three young Hebrew men that stood up against the king. But I want to give a little background. I want to set up the story real quick. So we were having study the other night with our children. We were reading Daniel chapter 1, which is the interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And so we know from, from history that Daniel actually interpreted the dream. And Nebuchadnezzar, under, under the, he threatened his wise men, his soothsayers, his magicians, and said, look, if you guys don't interpret this dream or tell me what it's about, I'm going to kill everybody. That's what he said, I'm going to kill everybody. And Daniel prayed and said, God, help me reveal this dream to the, the, to the king. And so here Nebuchadnezzar has a revelation a revelation from God himself that even he acknowledges that only God could have known this. Only God could have told him a dream that he had and interpreted it. And so what does Nebuchadnezzar do? Does he fall on his knees? Does he begin to worship God? Does he take down all the idols? No, what's he do? I'm going to build a statue with gold and silver and bronze and iron. Do we do that sometimes? Does God give us revelation in our lives? Does God give us those wow moments that we know he is there, that he, know he, is, he knows that he's paying attention to us, or we know? And then what do we do? We take that revelation and we put it aside and we continue to do the things that we were doing before. Now we laugh at that. We read Nebuchadnezzar's story here. We laugh at that and we say, well, how stupid is that? But sometimes we continue to do the same things. And here Nebuchadnezzar starts to build an image to worship after God has already revealed himself to the king. But here we have three young Hebrews. Three young Hebrews that would change the kingdom. Daniel 1, 6-7 says, Now from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. To them the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave Daniel the name Belshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. And you know, this caught my attention when we read this. Because I was like, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that's not their name. As a boxer once said, his mama called him Clay, I'm going to call him Clay talking about Muhammad Ali, because that was not his birth name, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were their real names. 
But they were given Babylonian names, and this is important, and I'll get to why it's important in a little bit. But Hananiah's name was changed to Shadrach. Shadrach, many people believe that to mean the command of Aku, not the fish. It's a Babylonian god. The fish would be, be a cool name. But no, this was referring to a Babylonian god. Mishael was changed to Meshach, which possibly means who is what Aku is. Again, referring to a Babylonian god. Azariah's name was changed to Abednego, possibly meaning servant of Nebo, another Babylonian god. So here we have three young Hebrew men that were brought in chains under captivity to the Babylonian nation. And they were given names that were not only different, but they were offensive. Can you imagine if we were under occupation from a foreign power and we were given names that pointed to someone else's God? Would you call me that? Would I call you that? No, it'd be offensive to me. And so here these young, these young Hebrew men are in a foreign nation. They have foreign names. And you have paganism all around, including their own names they were given. Now if you would turn with me to Daniel chapter 3, starting with verse 4. Starting with verse 4. It says, Then a herald cried aloud, To you it is commanded, O peoples, nations and languages, that at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, and symphony with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whatever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. So at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, and lyre, and symphony with all kinds of music, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshiped the gold image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Now I want you to just for a minute to try to imagine this. And this is where kids come into play because they have such vivid imaginations. And they ask questions. Like, what was it like? What was going on? You know, this was a big festive event. You know, this wasn't like people just showed up out in the field. This was a big event. They had the kahuku corn stand over there, right? They had the poo-poos over here. They had a big band playing. They had heralds, you know, uh, reading the edict out loud. And so this was a huge thing. And it says when the music starts to play, everybody starts to get down on their hands and knees and they begin to worship. Now you can imagine these three Hebrew men, these young men, are looking around and they see everybody bowing as the music plays. In church, you know, sometimes we assume that it was only Babylonians, but that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says all nations, peoples, tribes, and tongues, which means there could have possibly been other Hebrews in that crowd. Now you can imagine that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are looking around and they've got fellow Adventists in the crowd that are saying, right, get down, get down, get on your knees. Nobody will know, nobody cares. We know you love God. I know you love God. He understands. Their own church members, their friends, maybe family members, as they watched them bow before this, this heinous creation of man. And so they had to make a decision right there. They see the oven in the corner of their eye, they know. They see the smoke coming out of the, out of the fiery furnace. And they had to look over there and say, you know what, even if we have to go there, that's all right. I'm not bound to this thing. This thing, is, this thing is terrible. This thing is awful. And I know what God says. The commandment says, do not have any idols before me. And it doesn't say how tall they were. But it's not hard to see three young men amongst the sea of people prostrate before their idol. And so here you have these young men just standing here. Not hard to miss. Not hard to miss. But this sums up Satan's government right here. This sums up Satan's government. He says, I want you to bow before me. And if you don't, I have the fires ready. Oh, he puts on a good show. He has the band ready. He makes sure it's on all the TV channels. 
He makes a big show of it. And in the back of your head, you're not bowing out of love or reverence. You are bowing out of fear. And that is the summary of Satan's government, is fear, coercion by force. But someone had to go tell the king that these three Hebrews weren't obedient. It doesn't say who they were. It just says that they went and told the king, do you know what these guys are, not, are doing? Or in this case, not doing? You made an edict. You had the music playing. They knew that you're supposed to bow. And what happened? They stood there. They refused to bow before your, your idol. And so what does the king do? He says, bring them here. I want to have a little talk with these guys. And so here come the Hebrews being dragged in before the king. And he asked them, why didn't you bow? Daniel 3, 16, starting with verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, and this is one of the most beautiful verses in the Bible, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Friends, that's beautiful. What they're saying is, is regardless of whether God chooses to save us or not, we're not going to bow. We know he, he can, but if it's his will that we burn up in the furnace, then so be it. We're willing to go to the furnace. Friends, I, I pray for that kind of faith. It's easy for me to get up here and share God's word when I know that I'm not going to be put in a furnace. If we all had that kind of faith, friends, what kind of world would we have today? So Nebuchadnezzar is furious now because he's issued this edict. And these three young men defied what he's said. If you don't do, you're going to be put to death. And so what does he do? He orders them to be put into the furnace. And so off they go into the furnace. Now, you know, we kind of sensationalize these stories and we don't realize, I don't care how wonderful my faith is, there's going to be some fear there. You don't approach the furnace with joy and singing. I mean, you, you, there is some of that, but there's also some nervousness. You can imagine your heart starts beating real hard. You know what it's going to be like. You know that you feel the heat. And they're marched into the furnace. You know, I find it amazing that some of the king's men that actually took them to the furnace died themselves. But yet the Hebrews were safe. And this is a beautiful thing because Nebuchadnezzar had already seen Christ once. He'd already, he'd already had God revealed to him in the dream and the interpretation. Well, he gets to see him again because in the furnace he looks and what happens? He sees a fourth. He says, like the son of man. Do you find it odd that God has revealed himself not once but twice to a, a pagan king? A pagan king that has done things so offensive, that has enslaved his people, that has brought up idols into, you know, into this, this world and, and demanded that people worship before it under threat of death, but yet Christ reveals himself to the king. So this should give us hope for our leaders, right? Pray for them. Pray for them. No man is too debased. No man too sinful that Christ can't show himself to that man. And this is what Nebuchadnezzar got to see, a glimpse of Christ. So I want to share with you now what their real names mean. Hananiah means Yahweh has shown favor. Azariah means Yahweh has helped. And Mishael is who is like God. That's their real names. That's their birth names. Names that pointed to a God that delivered. And the king said, because there is no other God who can deliver like this, the king had to acknowledge it. The king got to see Jesus. He got to see deliverance firsthand from his own edict. And as the men walked out, not a singe, other than the ropes were, 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 were burned off. And so Nebuchadnezzar had to acknowledge God himself. 
Have you ever wanted to be like those young men? Have you ever read that story and thought, man, I wish I was there. I wish I was one of those Hebrew men that stood up against the king, that got to go through the furnace, that had Jesus there with me. And as I walked out of the furnace unscathed, I saw as the king himself acknowledged Christ. Well, friends, you're going to get that chance. As a wise man once said, it's deja vu all over again. Deja vu all over again. If you would turn with me to Revelation 13. Revelation 13. Let's say amen when you're there. Because we always wonder how, how stories relate. The Old Testament relates to the New Testament. But so many stories that, that they went through then are replaying now. And this is what I want to talk about. This is the meat of the matter here. Revelation 13, starting with verse 11. It says, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. He performs great signs, so that even he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs which he was granted to do in the sight of all that dwell on the earth. Oh, by the signs that which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. We've heard that before, the image. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Now, where have we heard that before? Worship the image or what? Or be killed. He causes all, both great and rich, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or their foreheads, that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark of the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Friends, this is replaying right now. Do you want to know what it was like to be those Hebrew young men? Just honor the Lord in today's society. You get your chance. Babylon, or the kingdom of Babylon, never ended. It had different names. It had different nations that, that took over its presence. But it never ended because Babylon represents whose kingdom? Satan's. It has never ended. Right now it sits in Rome. That's the modern Babylon. That's the final part of Nebuchadnezzar's statue. And you know, the wonderful part about this is, is God used Nebuchadnezzar's own greed and his own self-worth and his need to put up an idol as an object lesson. Because we use that idol today to what? To understand history. We know that the, the, the image actually represents the four kingdoms. And we knew that the feet, the toes, represents the final kingdom. So God used it for his purposes. Now that's pretty amazing. He used a pagan idol for his purposes to teach his people what was coming. But we face that today. We face today governments that pass laws that contradict God's law. And we have to stand in the crowd as we watch our brothers and sisters, even in our own churches, sometimes in our own families, bow before the image of the beast and as we stand up and as they would think we look like fools. So we are living it out here in these end days. And friends, it's not just about, we always use the Sabbath as, as, the, as the law, but we've passed more laws to violate than just the Sabbath. We have effectively made God's law null and void almost all, all the way through. So this is what I want to get to today. I have three points I want to share. The first is, it's all about worship. It's all about worship. Revelation 14, 6-7 says, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him 
who made the heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Do you see the two competing ideologies here? Nebuchadnezzar said all nations, tongues, tribes, and peoples. The beast image in Revelation, all nations, tribes, tongues, and peoples. But yet God commands us to preach the everlasting gospel to who? All nations, tribes, tongues, and peoples. We have competition. Competition that's always been there. It's all about worship. God wants our worship. And God uses only love to bid us to come to Him. That's it. He loves us. He says, I will not force you to worship me. I will give you heaven and earth. I will give up everything I can. I will give my son to die for you that you will love me and worship me. But if you don't, I will respect your choice. The devil says, you will worship me or in the oven you're going. In the oven you're going. It's all about worship. But friends, we don't have to fear the oven. We don't have to fear what man can do to us. Because even if God chooses not to save us and we go through that oven, our next conscious thought will be that of Jesus. We will see his face and we will go up to see him. That's not a bad way to go. That's not a bad way to go. It's all about worship. The second thing is, the second point is, resistance is not futile. Resistance is not futile. Hope you Trekkies appreciate that reference. The Babylonians wanted to assimilate the Hebrews. They wanted them to be more pagan. That's why they gave them pagan names. They wanted to bring all these nations together and say, forget about your gods, forget about who you worship, forget about your language. You are one of us now. You need to assimilate it into our culture. But the Hebrews they didn't want anything to do with that. They said, we worship the one true God. We want nothing to do with your paganism. We want nothing to do with your statues. We want nothing to do with your, your, your little idol gods because they are just wood and stone. They're just metal. They're nothing to us. But church, they knew where their help came from. And I want to encourage you, as we are in the crowd, the sea of people, as we watch them bow before the beast, we bow before the image, bow before whatever this earth has to offer them, and, and, I, and I joke sometimes, but this is the truth. We have enough idols in America. We don't need an image. Between sports, between entertainment, between everything else, we have enough idols that keep our attention, that we spend so much time and so much effort in. The devil doesn't have to build an image. There's multiple images. There's multiple choices for us to choose from. Don't look around. Look up. Don't look around. Don't look around at, at who's doing what. Don't look around at, at the person who's prostrate before this image. Look up to Christ. Psalm 121, 1 through 2 says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence comes my help? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. You notice the constant reference to who made, the creator who made. That's where our worship comes from. That's why in the end times we have competing ideologies. We have man's law and God's law. We have the creator and we have the created. And that's our two choices. Don't look around. Look up. It's discouraging sometimes to see friends, to see neighbors, to see family members following that path that we know is, leads to destruction. It's hard to stand there while everyone else that you know is doing the opposite. It is hard to stand there when you know what it's going to bring. You know the scorn it's going to bring. You know the people are, going to, are not going to talk to you anymore. You know you're going to lose friends. You know the, the family member is not going to Facebook you anymore because you have stood for the truth. But it all has an end game. And we know our Lord went to the same thing. A man who was so good and so perfect and so loving and so gentle and kind was treated with such disdain they didn't even treat murderers like that. But he overcame the world and he will help us do the same thing. So resistance is not futile. The last point is this time the fire is not meant for us. This time the fire is not meant for us. 
You know, Satan has used coercion and force all this time to try to get us to worship before him. But the next fire that consumes the earth was never meant for us. God never intended his creatures, his, his created beings on this earth to ever experience destruction. He made that for Satan and his angels. This is one of the reasons that the doctrine of eternal hell is so offensive to me. Because this puts Satan's character on God's character. Satan likes to torment. Satan likes to coerce. Satan likes to kill. Satan likes to steal. He likes those things. And we have a whole world that preaches this, that somehow that our loving, benevolent God that would give his son would endlessly torture us for millennials. Does that sound like the character of God to you? The God that you know? But yet the whole world teaches it. Our Protestant brothers and teachers teach that, if you, that God loves you so much, but don't make him angry. Are you going to get it? It's a shame when the whole world believes that God's character is closer to Satan's. But the fire was never meant for us. It was meant for him and his angels. Revelation 20.10 says, The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. We know what happens in the end. Now Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they may not have known, they obviously didn't, you know, given their reply to the king, that they were going to make it through the fire. They didn't know. But we already know what happens. God has given us the opportunity to know ahead of time. He said there would be tribulation, but some of us will get to meet Christ alive. And I don't know about you, but that gives me hope. I'm not exactly thrilled to think that I'd be in the oven or to be persecuted, to be killed, or to be, to be, you know, somehow to go through what our Lord went through or for so many of the Christians during the Reformation have gone through. But friends, we know what happens in the end. We know who wins. This is like picking a, a, your favorite team and letting them win the championship and you get to join a team after they win the championship. You get the ring, you get the trophy, you get everything. And you did nothing. This is what God in his love has done for us. He has already won the war. And he has just asked us to follow in his footsteps. But just like these, these young Hebrew men, we are asked to do the same thing. We are asked to stand up against the sea, the crowd, the people that are doing the opposite. And I know, friends, it's increasingly harder in this world. It's increasingly harder in this nation to go against the grain. We look like a bunch of fools. We look like a bunch of troublemakers, don't we? But that's all right. You and God are a majority. You and God are a majority. If you are the only one that stands up in that crowd and you are with the Lord Almighty, then you are a majority right there. doesn't matter what everybody else does. So friends, I just want to encourage us today as we, as we close out. We are living the lives of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. We are living their lives out right now. And we were asked to do the same thing. We were asked to stand up and be counted. Regardless of the circumstances, regardless of how much in the minority we are, we are asked to stand up. And God has promised us that the oven's not for us. It's not for us. He has promised us heaven. He has promised us a mansion. He has promised us that we will see His face and we will spend eternity with Him. We just have to get through this little time, this short time that we have. And I want to encourage you today, lift up each other in prayer every week because the devil tries to coerce us. He tries to beat us down. He tries to drag us kicking and screaming into places we don't want to go, doing things we don't want to do. And all we have to do is cry out to God and know that he will save us. He will redeem us. And he is there with us. If we have to go in the oven, he'll be in there with us. If we have to go to jail, he'll be in the jail with us. If we have to hear scorn and persecution from our friends and family, he will be there with us because he has gone through it already. And that's my final message to today, friends, is that Christ has already gone through it. Look to Christ. That's where our help comes from. 
Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for your blessings. I want to thank you for the many examples in the Bible to give us courage, Father. And you know the, the things we're facing today, you know our nation, our, our world is, is, is hopelessly lost, Father. I just ask that you help us to make a difference in this world, Father. You help us stand that we're bold, Father. We're bold for you. 